This is the Shift Heads Podcast with Shane Hewitt and friends. Welcome to the Shift Heads Podcast. I'm Shane Hewitt. Steve Stebbing is here, and it is time for us to get into what the hell should we watch this weekend. Hey, Shane, how you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing all right. It's, we you know, we're we're still trudging through the beginning of the Monday of 2024 right now, yep. so it feels... Got it. Um, there, there's not a lot of meat on the bone right now, uh, but things are going to start to get bigger. I do have some fun stuff this week. I, I managed to still make it fun though. All right, cool. Well, let's get started with your uh, first one on the list here. One of many to chat about in the upcoming video, Freud and his last session. Yes. I mean, this has Anthony Hopkins and Matthew Good in it, uh, doing their best character work um to, as they're good at and when it comes to these real life people you have to do it to a t so you got anthony hopkins doing the sigmund freud in this and uh matthew good plays c.s lewis uh the issue because this is you know speculated to be freud's last last meeting though it's all speculation this isn't based on a real meeting because in his ledger it's listed as blank they don't know who his last person was so the movie speculates that it was c.s lewis and this is before the chronicles of narnia before the huge height of c.s lewis's career i think he at this point he had like a middling not even a hit book, but he had released a book at this point, but it didn't do very well. Interesting. But just knowing that side of it, I don't know. I think it rubbed me the wrong way. The fact that it's not reality it is not a real well, thing. Isn't that it? I mean, this is that conversation we've had here before, Steve, is that there is a mm -hmm. point where fiction is fiction. Mm -hmm. And then there's a point where we've seen it with documentaries and many other things that they play it off. Like it's what happened don't make mm -hmm. any declaration that it didn't for sure anyway happen that it's a speculation you know at least on tv commercials we see you know these are paid actors or whatever mm -hmm. right like mm -hmm. or they're not paid actors and and it tends to especially with the power of the internet influence history in a way that it makes me feel uncomfortable to be honest yeah i, I mean it just i think it just takes the wind out of the sails because how it was presented to me is in a postscript they're like they what it wasn't sure that c.s lewis was this last session and it's like hold up <laughs> why are you telling me this after i've watched all of this yeah because I nobody feel... not everybody stays that's like when yeah. they get something wrong in the newspaper back in the day and they would it was on the front page on the day and then mm -hmm. when they made the apology or the correction it was hidden in the back page in the bottom yeah. right corner right retractions are on page 17. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. i struggle with that no and i understand yeah. it's a movie but, mm -hmm. you know, everybody knows that Tom Hanks in Mission Impossible or in Top Gun, everyone knows that that's based on some events, but those characters are all fiction and, yeah. you know, that's a real school and that's how people get trained and all that stuff. But they, everybody knows that. And mm -hmm. this gray area in movies where they try to play it off as fact a little bit, but they don't really make that declaration. I struggle, bud. I really do. I think it takes away from the experience of it all. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. It, that that's for me what it did because I had such I'd given such weight to some of these conversations because there's some great conversations in this, but then when you realize that m these are just embellished by a writer, it just takes the just takes the sap out of it, you know. All right, so we'll get into that coming up. Plus, speaking speaking of based on the truth, the crown is something that I, mm -hmm. I finished watching. Mm -hmm. Right, the crown is not real; it no. is uh, based on stories they don't know what happened behind the scenes it's very similar to this some of the actors have come out and said you guys need to declare this as fiction right mm -hmm. people are going to remember it this way mm -hmm. and um i could there's a couple of things now you're i'm done you're not done no i, I like how it ended i also don't like how it ended there's so much more meat on that bone i feel like mm -hmm. they just ran out of money <laughs> mm -hmm. or or that the queen passed and they just felt it wasn't yeah, right sort of a, a dignified way yeah they ended it with um and i don't want to ruin it for you or anybody else that hasn't seen the end of it but they really did an amazing job with the reflection part of mm -hmm. planning the funerals of philip and, and elizabeth 
that's where they kind of get into is planning the funerals, okay. right? There's two people that they make look really, really bad in that movie. And one is Dodi Fayed's dad. In mm -hmm. fact, they basically blame him for her dying in the way that he forced his son to propose in France, da 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 da. They weren't really engaged, but he faked it. And then um, Kate Middleton's mom. Okay. They I'm make her yet, out to yeah. be, you've got that part already. You've seen that part. And no, they, no, I'm actually just meeting Kate in the next episode. So. Okay. So yeah. the, the Kate Middleton's mom gets made out to be this sort of serpent of making sure her daughter is in the same place he is right. Trying to, mm -hmm. everyone's trying to climb the ladder and yeah. that's, that's, that's what they make it out to be. Mm -hmm. And at the expense of the real life people, yeah. That may or may not have been nice people or mean people. I don't know, but it it mm -hmm. seems, I it makes me feel uncomfortable, but worth the watch. Yeah, they make Dodi Fayed's dad act with a lot of ego, even after Dodi has passed and everything, and he's he's trying to um, celebrate his and Diana's life through Buckingham Palace, and they kind of slap him down, and his ego is hurt most of all. Like that's. Yeah what they really push well, there's a rant episode. coming up that you haven't seen yet that will i impress okay. you yeah okay gotcha uh, well because the findings of the investigations of the car crash is yet to come for you right so, right yeah yeah okay well there you go there's a couple for you that's freud's last session i suggest the crown and last on the list here though uh, before we get into the full big one that steve's got uh is echo oh Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, a five episode <laughs> echo off of the Hawkeye series that came out, uh, not this past Christmas, but the year before. Um, it, it's a rock'em sock'em uh, a story around Echo. Uh, uh, the character's name is Maya, played by Alakma Cox. Uh, this, this series is very proudly indigenous, which I really, really loved about it and made by a lot of people that made like reservation dogs and dark winds. So there is a lot of indigenous representation in this um, and the fight scenes. I'll get into it in my video here, but the fight scenes are just delicious. They're so damn good. I don't like that. It says it's Marvel spotlight because it means I'm confused if this is actually part of the MCU. There's ties to the MCU in it, but I don't know. I digress. I'll talk about it on the episode coming up. There you go. Well, Steve stebbing.ca. If you want to get in touch with Steve and you could do us both a favor, if you want, um, subscribe to Steve's channel linked below in the description. You can also subscribe to uh, my channel, which is this channel where you're seeing this video. And that's what helps us the most share it with your friends as well. All of the bits and pieces, uh, Shane Hewitt.ca and shiftheads.ca for all of it. Are you ready to go? Ready to roll the, roll the film. Let's do it. Hello, everybody, and welcome to What the Hell Should I Watch? Second video of January, still in a little bit of a dead zone as far as when it comes to new releases. But I did last week tease uh, American Fiction, so that will be my first video. That will be my first review of the episode. Uh, first, thank you for watching the video. If you could like the video and subscribe, that would be amazing. So let's head into it. American Fiction. This is the new film from Cord Jefferson. He wrote and directed this film. Uh, it stars Jeffrey Wright, Tracy Ellis Ross, uh, Sterling K. Brown, who almost steals the film in many ways. But uh, this is really Jeffrey uh, Wright's movie as uh, he plays a novelist that's kind of sick of the profiteering off of black stories and, and black lives and the stereotyping of it. Just the, the fact that thug stories get elevated in, in, and, and they seem um, white friendly all the time, these stories. So he, out of frustration, basically writes one of these stories and it gets picked up like that and it becomes sort of like an escalating out of control but also a one-upmanship that is kind of perpetrated by Wright's character as well as his uh, publisher played by uh, John Ortiz uh, his, his book agent um, and I love this movie this is a full-on masterpiece in my opinion uh, even has stuff in it that I think would be 
harder to take for people that maybe are a bit jaded uh, when it comes to it. Um, some sweet some sweet storyline in it and it's almost like a b story or a c story in it but i feel like jaded people would be like turned off by it but i really dug into this part of the story and i i really really loved it um like i said sterling k brown is incapable absolutely incapable of being uninteresting every scene he's in and he's kind of going through this flailing new discovery existence and he's just kind of falling apart through it and it's just really 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 well done and uh i i really think that this is that black cinema film to hold up that has a voice and has something very 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 important to say um and i i really think people should watch it because i think it is the most important movie of 2023 in my opinion the next film uh, is new this week. It's called Freud's Last Session. This is a new film from Matt Brown, uh, whose previous film uh, is The Man Who Knew Infinity, the mathematician movie with uh, Dev Patel. Kind of a limited release that came out. This is a limited release as well. It stars Anthony Hopkins and Matthew Good. And uh, basically, you know that Hopkins plays Freud in it, because of course he does. But this is the last session that the famous Sigmund Freud had and it's all speculation which kind of takes me out of the movie quite a bit because the speculation in this film is that Matthew Good's character C.S. Lewis was the final meeting that Freud had on his books even though the last meeting Freud had on his books was not publicized and only close people being his daughter really knows who was that person but at the head of it all Anthony Hopkins and Matthew Good are two of the best character actors in the game today and Matthew Good is consistently and constantly underrated in my opinion he is like people who who know film know who he is but as far as a mainstream audience I, I think it, it's harder to to pinpoint what his name is um, and I just think he's been doing amazing work for well over two decades now i would say and uh this is like a great showcase of that i just really wish that the film wasn't so dull in places and just kind of lost me just in in the monotony like the tete -a tete stuff when they're really heated and it really really works but when they're just kind of like languishing in Freud's like kind of separation from reality in places here and there it starts to lose me but it is gorgeously shot and um I think it would appeal to an older audience I just think and especially people that like biopics I just think that this one kind of loses me a bit I will say that there is a casting of a of J.R.R. Tolkien in this, and he's played by Stephen Campbell Moore, and I just think it's just absolutely brilliant casting. Like it was really, I mean, it's so quick; it's a very quick moment. But I was like, that was actually pretty solid. That was better than the casting of uh, Nicholas Holt in that Tolkien film, which also wasn't very good. I think this movie was better than the Tolkien movie, if we're being honest. Oh, also interesting enough. Anthony Hopkins played C.S. Lewis in the 1993 film Shadowlands for Richard Attenborough. Sorry, Sir Richard Attenborough and Sir Anthony Hopkins. Got to get all that stuff right, you know. They're knights after all. All right, the next one up is Eileen. This is the new film from uh, William Oldroyd, whose only other film to date is Lady Macbeth, which kind of baffles me that, because I saw Lady Macbeth, I want to say that that movie came out in 2018, so it's a five-year gap for him to make this new film um, and again he's relying on the brilliance of a really great actors uh, because of course the lead of Lady Macbeth was Florence Pugh that was the first time I saw her in a movie I guess that's the first time a, everyone saw her in a movie because I believe that was her debut um, but again Eileen is driven on the performances of two great actresses this time one lead actress in Thomas and Mackenzie who you may have seen in Last Night in Soho or Leave No Trace or uh, Jojo Rabbit she's just a great actress on the cusp of becoming B A list she's going to be A list really soon and I think Eileen is another stepping stone to get there 
but we'll get into that in a second. The supporting role and the other actress that really leads this film uh, in, in a great direction and gives it some real meat to it is Anne Hathaway, who I think is entering some of the best work in her career, some of the best performances in her career. And I love the sort of femme fatale that she's doing here. Like, not really a fatale, but more like she's drawing in this character of Eileen. So I'm kind of spacing here. So Eileen, basically the story follows Thomas and Mackenzie as Eileen. She, and it takes place in, I think the forties, fifties era. Uh, and basically she works at a correctional facility and, um, is very mousy, uh, very demure keeps to herself. And, um, uh, but also under the surface, like, sexually charged to like a bursting degree uh she lives with her father played by shay wiggum who is amazing in every scene that he's in uh and it's not a good relationship at all it, it, it is emotionally abusive leading to possibly physically abusive but it is not it's not a good relationship so she becomes infatuated with a new with the new person that comes into the facility which is anne hathaway's character um and it starts to bring her out of her shell more I'll kind of stop the synopsis there because I don't want to give too much. The story really does need to open up to you, especially if you're going to get to a third act, will which may or may not lose people because it is a little bit wild in its scope of where it goes. Um, but I dig this film a lot. I mean, those three actors alone, uh, Mackenzie, Hathaway, and Wiggum, are incre incredible. And also has, uh, I want to say her name is Siobhan Fallon. Uh, she's kind of like a like a supporting character actress in a lot of stuff, but she plays one of the more contemptuous uh, uh, workers at this facility towards Eileen. I really just like her aesthetic. I, I've always enjoyed her aesthetic every time that she's on screen, so I dig her a lot in this one too. Um, it's really hard to hold this movie up to Lady Macbeth, which is a freaking masterpiece. Eileen does fall short of that bar. I would give it probably around a three and a half out of five. Like I, I love the aesthetic. I love the way it was shot, um, which was Ari Wagner did this one, um, who also did Lady Macbeth with the old Roy before, but she also did uh, Jane Champion's uh, Power of the Dog. She also did In Fabric for Peter Strickland and uh, The Wonder, which also starred Florence Pugh. Um, she just shoots this one so beautifully. And I mean, the opening shot and the opening scene, I, I really thought saw it just sets a really interesting tone for it and gives it that forties serial kind of look to it. And I, I dug everything about that. All right. So next up is, uh, well, let's just say the spirit of Stuart Gordon and his Lovecraft adaptations, like from beyond or reanimator. That stuff, I think, is alive and well if we give that stuff to Everly director Joe Lynch uh, and also podcaster with Adam Green, Joe Lynch, because uh, Joe Lynch did Suitable Flesh. This is an adaptation of a H.P. Lovecraft short story, The Thing That Was Left on the Step, I believe it was called, um, and it stars uh, Heather Graham, Barbara Crampton, Bruce Davison's in this movie quickly. Uh, this movie is pretty wild because it is absolutely taking that tone of the early to mid nineties horror, especially that despair horror that William, I mean, that Stuart Gordon really honed. Um, and I mean, you have the jarring kind of overdone score, um, the melodrama may be a little, um, towards that, uh, cheesier B side, like that heightened, um, that heightened feel of it but basically um heather graham plays a psychologist who um who uh, one day takes on a, a very frantic new patient uh, a young man that says that he is basically being hunted by an entity that wants his body so yeah this is full-on body horror body swap and all of the blood gore and despair that you expect out of something that lovecraft would make done through a filter of Joe Lynch, a guy that is just so ingrained in the horror genre that he knows exactly what to do with this story. It's almost like when I was talking about Eli Roth's Thanksgiving last week. Like it took so long for the for a project like that to be given to the perfect individuals. 
And it almost, like, once you get to the end credits, it's like a no-brainer. It's like, well, yeah, they should have been doing this the whole time. So that's exactly how I felt about Suitable Flesh. It is so schlocky in ways, and I really, really love that Barbara Crampton is freaking treasure. And just every moment with her is just just a genre doubloon. Like, it's, it's just so much fun. And Heather Graham, her performance is really bold. Um, it, it's sex kidney in a way um, that that I think really works because it, it is it is reminiscent of a movie like I will almost like a horror movie I would find on like Skinamax in a certain way because there are kind of those scenes because she has some pretty heavy scenes with this young actor. I'm spaced on what his name is and I apologize to him. Uh, but there's also another sex scene with Jonathan Skage, who plays her husband in this one. Um, but she I mean, she's also embodying all these different body swap moments in these different souls being in her body we'll call it um and it is pretty multifaceted and uh i mean this is a girl that came from twin peaks for so for doing weird stuff uh heather graham's always game and you can tell that she's so willing to go for the gusto in this film um i will also say that there is a moment in this scene in this film where they use a backup cam as like a uh, as just like a, a mode to 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 tell the story a little bit. I don't want to get too deep into it because it's a little bit spoilery. But for those who see it, I mean, tweet me at the Steve Dead and, or find me and, and and let's geek out about this because I think Joe Lynch has just done the diabolical with this backup cam and and just absolutely made it incredible like i i think my i think my mouth was slack open when i was watching this scene so those who have seen suitable flesh you know exactly what i'm talking about and please tell me if i'm wrong i don't think anything like that's been done with a backup cam before it's so so divisive and i i think it's so it's so good so joe lynch you are a glorious mf -er. you really really are all right, and one of the the last new releases that I was that I received uh, was from Wellgo USA. They sent me a DVD of it. I they didn't make the transition for this one to Blu-ray. It's just a DVD. It is called The Flying Swordsman. It's also known as The Hidden Fox. So if you look for an IMDb or you look for it on Rotten Tomatoes, you're not going to find it under uh, under The Flying Swordsman, which feels like kind of like a stock name essentially, um, but. Uh, yeah, so it's called The Hidden Fox. So the story basically follows this main hero, the, the Hidden Fox, as he's known. And he is, uh, for the the security of the land, he is trying to take down these eight storied villains. And uh, this is this is like kind of ancient China um, and those big wushu uh, fight scenes, which look really, really good. Like they did a really, really great job. There's a really great windswept quality. There's scenes with snow and leaves falling off trees. Like it has that whole anime kind of scope to it. But every time that they come in and they try to make CG massage things along, it loses any good quality to it because you kind of start to notice that it is a lower budget film and it also in the storytelling it just loves to just do this okay well let's go back two hours it just and then we'll go back two hours and then we'll go back two hours and i'm sorry you're not tarantino and i don't want to see a tarantino s type thing in my wushu martial arts film really like i'll give it a try if you're doing it for a reason that's interesting to me or that you're doing it well none of those are the case for this film and i also will put a nail in the coffin on the hidden fox or the flying swordsman or whatever you want to call it well go would like to call it the flying swordsman but i will say that there is a scene with hyenas they're fighting hyenas and all of them are cg all of them have the same repeating hyena laugh and it's so corny and so badly done to the point that i was chuckling to myself i was trying not to laugh full on but i was definitely chuckling to myself because it just threw water on any fire that this movie had going for it so uh yeah i really did not dig anything about flying uh flying swordsman i almost called it the flying dutchman see I'm, it's already that far out of my brain
All right. You know, with the holiday season and everything and, and not a lot going on on Blu-ray or in the theaters, I decided to check out something older. I went on to uh, Prime Video and I watched Julia DeCarno's Titan. And this movie is divisive, genre heavy, focused, definitely for a certain niche of audience. But without a doubt, a freaking masterpiece. This movie rules. Agatha Roussel gives an just otherworldly performance that is just the writhing baseline for everything that you're seeing through this film like there is nothing like this film in, in, in anything that I've ever seen and I know DeCorno did Raw which is a, a movie that is very separated and very in its own category as well but Titan is like I, I feel like it's just the it's another step and not only like another step but like a riser it's so it is, it is so heightened and, and so beautiful too disturbing and, and and gets in your skin and Vincent Linden is also I mean a veteran actor who has so many great performances under his belt but this is such a freeing performance for him um and, and seeing some of these dance scenes, uh, are just incredible. I don't even want to try to explain what Titan is about for anyone that hasn't seen it before, but just know if you're going to watch this movie, there is like some disturbing amounts of body horror and, and, and stuff towards the, the Cronenbergian side of, of thrillers. Just know that you're getting into something completely wild because I think it's best to go into this movie with kind of no knowledge of what's going on. But uh, it's just, I, I, I'm just so astounded by this film. And, and, and it's a film that you just will always think about. Like, it, it just will always stick in my head, especially that final scene. It was just almost broke my brain. It's just so disturbing, but also so hor- horribly beautiful. I, I don't even know how to how to classify it. it. It is just so, so, so wild. And I also really like how... This is like a dark and disturbing story, but it also has these like threads of dark comedy that spider web through it and, and rear their head here and go away there and come back and just holy hell, what the hell is this movie? Like, I know it was amazing, but holy hell, how do you even write that? Like, just to get in Julia DeCarnau's head for a second and just be like, what's around here? Because like, what's next? Like, seriously, how do you follow this movie? I am like, just at a standstill with it <laughs> really absolutely all right let's do some television we'll we'll quickly bounce through some things so this week disney plus is going to be releasing echo which is sort of a follow-up to hawkeye uh the series from a couple uh, from not this past christmas but the christmas before and uh this features alakwa quack uh alakwa cox's character of echo or maya and what happens after that series. So at the end of the Hawkeye series, spoilers, she shoots Kingpin and you believe he's dead. So she basically goes home, uh, goes to her hometown, because this is a very indigenous infused production. And, and there's so much pride throughout all three of the five episodes that I've watched so far. Because they didn't give me the other two yet, but that's just another story. Um, and it is a hard R show with some incredible fight cinema, cinema uh, sequences in it. Uh, that are reminiscent of the Daredevil series on Netflix. So the best thing that you can do, and I, I know the Bourne movies, they are great, but they kind of screwed things up because they moved everything really close. So you can't exactly see what's going on, but... Echo, they brought it back, they let it breathe, and they let the action speak for itself. And it is mind-blowing. Like, the each fight scene is just so well executed. I loved everything about this show. Like, I, I, I'm not being a Marvel shell on this one. I really, really, really dug this show. I don't know what its placement in the Marvel Cinematic Universe really is because they're being so vague on it. They're calling it a Marvel Spotlight show, which they're saying that it is Marvel Cinematic Universe adjacent, which I'm not sure about that because Hawkeye appears, albeit in a little bit of a flashback in this series. 
I mean, Kingpin, the Kingpin from the Marvel Cinematic Universe is in this series. I don't see. So I'm just really kind of confused with what uh, Feige and, and the powers that be at Marvel Cinematic uh, at Marvel Studios are trying to do with this one because it's kind of. I don't know. I, I'm a little confused on that. But I do, like I said, I love the indigenous voice that's in this one. There's a lot of crossover with uh, Reservation Dogs and Dark Winds in this with the cat with the production and writers. Um, and uh, Zon McCutcheon, I think his name is, he's briefly in the show in the beginning. But Davery Jacobs, who plays Alora Dannon on Reservation Dogs, is kind of a, a mainish supporting character in this one and I adore her so when I saw her pop up in it I was like yes because I mean I'm all about reservation dogs right now I'm late to the game uh the wife and I are con- currently watching it and in love with every single episode so to see her show up in it I was like yes so uh echo I think it's a hit I'm going to make a little quick stop on this Netflix one. Uh, The new season of Breakpoint is coming out. This is a a tennis-centric sports documentary in a series form from Netflix. Um, And largely, this this show follows uh, Australian tennis player Nick Kyrgios. Uh, and I mean, I know my way a bit around tennis. I don't watch it regularly, but I'm a sucker like a music documentary. I'm a sucker for a, a good and, and well-told, uh, sports documentary. I mean, I watched coach prime, uh, a few weeks ago and, and, and enjoyed that. And I, I also like, uh, formula one drive to survive. I was late to the game on that one. Not really a big formula one racing guy, but I do like the drama and the reality in the show. So I do watch that. And then there's Braun, uh, which is hosted by Keanu Reeves. That one's on Disney+. Plus. Enjoyed that one as well. But I don't know. There's something about Breakpoint that I find fascinating. I think it's because Curios is an interesting character to base your show around because um, he feels like sort of an outsider to the sport, at least the way that I'm interpreting. He, he, he's a guy that's not dedicated to going to every tournament. Um, he only plays certain times a year. He's brash. He's controversial. He's outspoken. He's very much like almost, he's almost like the sports entertainer wrestler of, of tennis like he's playing to the crowd a lot he's admonishing the crowd a lot like it's just it's interesting stuff and uh it's stuff that i can definitely get behind and watch more of so i just started breakpoint there's a new season this week um yeah i think i might continue on this one all right let's get to some geek outs so this one you know i know a lot of not a lot of people are like i'm gonna go out and buy a, a volume of family guy but I've already started the collection. I was three volumes deep and now they're starting to package them in like five season boxes for like 30 bucks ish. I wasn't quite yet there yet. So I bought volume four really cheap. It was like eleven ninety nine on Amazon prime. Like it was just an easy, easy buy. I got that one. It was just I'm just trying to fill up that collection Um, and I just wanted to bring it to this show just for if anybody does like Family Guy, loves physical media like I do, because I also have the uh, Star Wars movies that they made and everything. um, They're all they're like blowing them out now. They're really cheap. I want them to start doing this with the Simpsons seasons the simpsons box sets although they won't i know they won't because those ones are paper pull out some of them had the plastic uh, clamshell that were all the character heads they won't do that the simpsons so at least fox is doing it with family guy um i'm hoping that they might do it with other shows that i'm still trying to collect the back end of like how i met your mother uh my name is earl stuff like that so it's a good sign that at least one of their shows are going for pretty cheap right now and also, this should be noted that the season, a uh, volume I'm talking about is volume four, which was the season that the first of the re- the first season where the show was resurrected. So the show was canceled after the first three seasons. Volume four is the beginning of the new run. Yeah, so that that's where it is in the timeline. 
Uh, late arrival that I got from Warner, uh, from Michael at Warner, who hooks me up. I love this dude so much. He's a great dude. Uh, and he sent me The Nun 2. Uh, and this movie came out and I guess, I don't know. I don't know where I am on the mailing list for uh, Warner Bros., but I never received it. But that's okay because I got the 4K version, which is way better looking it's so pristine on that screen and especially with this film because i really love the character design of valak the nun like i just think she's so creepy looking and bonnie aaron just delivers and actually speaking of bonnie aaron she sued just before this movie came out because they were using the likeness without paying her and um i'm wondering how that uh how that lawsuit went did bonnie take him down like valid valak takes people down I hope so. I really hope so. What another thing that I like about these nun movies is it's a showcasing within the Conjuring universe for Tessa Formiga to do her stuff, which is great because her mom Vera is Elaine uh, is uh, Elaine is it Elaine Warren? Ah, uh, the the Warren wife. <laughs> <laughs> that does the Conjuring movies. Um, Vera Farmiga does those movies. Tasia does the Flash, the 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 early prequel movies. Like it's just like it's a nice tandem. Like the the Farmiga women are like well represented by James Wan in his uh, Conjuring universe. I kind of dig that. But I will say that this movie is diminishing returns. Uh, there are th- those cool atmospherical elements that make the film work. I enjoy Storm Reed a lot, who's in this one. Uh, she was also in Searching, uh, that uh, computer interface thriller. So she's kind of on a high note with me right now. So I, I'm enjoying her, seeing her and stuff. And there is a scene, there's a little bit of it in the trailer that takes place at, uh, the, at a newsstand. And it is the most effective set piece in the entire film, in my, pers- in, in my opinion. Um, and I will say... This movie is missing Damien Bajir. He's what I really liked about the first Nun movie. And even when that guy goes over the top, it still feels like it has gravita and weight to it. I don't know. He's just got a quality to him. The last one is one that I bought for myself. Uh, It's called Max Manus, Man of War. It's a Norwegian World War II film uh, directed by Joaquin Ronning and Espen Sandberg. Uh, And uh, this is the movie they did before they got uh, international acclaim for doing the at sea movie Contiki, which ended up getting them the Disney job of making Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Men Tell No Tales, which I believe was the last of the uh was it the last of the uh pirates moves or was it stranger tides was it rob marshall or was it these guys i don't know i i they're there's they're flipping around in my head but i like these guys as filmmakers when they're together and this movie rocks i mean it is it, basically it follows Max Manus, who was a saboteur uh, during during the war, basically taking down Nazis where he could. Um, and it stars Axel Henney, uh, who um, American audiences will know from Ridley Scott's The Martian, uh, and he because he's really good in that sh- that movie. Uh, but recently, if you saw the film Zizu, you would have seen Axel as one of the villains of that film, and. I mean, if you haven't seen Zizou, watch freaking Zizou like right now. It is one of the best action films of 2023. And I just loved every second of that film. But this movie rocks like Max Manus, Man of War. It it has such great pacing to it, such great thrilling suspense to it. You wonder if he is going to get caught or if or or just the dire consequences coming down on him. Uh, I really, really dug this one. Obviously, Norway dug this one. It was the biggest hit. It was one of uh, one of Norway's biggest hits in theaters at the time. And uh, yeah, it's just a movie that came out. I think I might have been working at a video store when it came out and kind of pushing it on to people. But really, nobody talked about this movie. And like I said, these guys didn't hit it big till Kuntiki. So yeah, I was I, I had to buy this one. So. I spent a, I may have spent like 20 bucks on it, but uh, in my personal opinion, worth every penny. And I can't watch, wait to watch it again on a good uh, sound system for sure. All right. So that is it for this week on what the hell should I watch? I just want to give a quick 
preview that next week's video, I'll be kicking it off with the new Blumhouse January horror film. We only know how those go unless it's, you know, Megan, which was killer. But this is Night Swim. Yeah, we got haunting swim haunted swimming pools up in this piece. Yeah, but it's got Wyatt Russell, so I'm so in. For sure in, because Wyatt Russell rocks. If you're not watching Monarch right now, come on, watch it. Anyway, you can find me on Twitter, because I won't call it the other thing, Instagram, Threads, and Letterboxd, at the Steve Dead. My website, stevestebbing.ca. You can find this YouTube video on YouTube under the account Steve Stebbing. And you might also find this on shiftheads.ca or at the Shiftheads group on Facebook. I'm Steve Stebbing. Again, if you could give a like and a subscribe, that would make my life just that much better. I would love you so much for it. But I love you guys anyway for watching this video. So until next time, where we're talking, night swim. Thank you and talk to you next week.